All right. Hello, 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 everybody. So good to have you here. We are talking about body image, sexuality, all the things. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's so good to see you all here. Um, this is only going to be one hour, but it is going to be a power packed one hour because body image is something we definitely need to talk about. So I'm so happy that you're all joining us to talk about this. You know, it's one of those things uh, that when we're in midlife and we have like our body doesn't change, our body is always changing from the time we're born. But somehow, when we think about sex and sexuality, we have a concept of what is okay for our body to look like for us to give ourselves permission to engage in sex. And so I really want to talk about this. And of course, I want to talk to our expert and we're going to get started in a minute. But first, I'm going to introduce myself. I am Dr. Sonia Wright. I'm a medical doctor. I'm a sexual counselor. I am a master certified life coach. And I love all things about the toys. And tonight I have just one of the most fabulous coaches that I know. And it is an honor to do any work with her. I can't even tell you how much I adore this person. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was putting together the lit, lit team, like I just knew that she had to be a part of this. And so I am going to introduce you to coach, master coach, Lisa Haddlestad, and I'm going to have her do her introductions. And then we're going to talk a little bit while she's introducing herself. Feel free to put any questions that you have in the Q&A. The Q&A is open. Feel free to put any questions you have there. If you want to put it in the chat, feel free to put it in the chat. The chat only goes to hosts and panelists, which is us, and the Q&A only goes to hosts and panelists. There is an anonymous feature in the Q&A, so feel free to put that in the Q&A, any questions that you feel that you want to um, add. Feel free to just contact us. And once again, this is Lisa Hedlstad. Please introduce yourself, and we'll get started. Hey, hi, everyone. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I just love that introduction. <laughs> Heartwarming and I love it and I love being on the lit flip team and I was smiling because you said it very carefully. It's a it's a something to get the tongue used to and I'm getting better at it. So I'm so proud about that. Um yeah, I am a master life and intimacy coach. Um I have worked with Sonia for quite a few weeks now within the advanced certification in women's sexual intimacy course for coaches and just absolutely love that. Um, I also have my own business and my primary focus is to put it really simply, I help women dissolve shame to really understand their shame and, and, you know, start with the process of, of letting go of that because shame is not like a, uh, it's not one of those feelings we have internally that's natural, like sadness or happiness. It's something that is in response to external um, learning. And yeah, that's what I do. So glad to be here talking to you all about body, body image, everything. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that introduction. It's so good to see you and to be excited that you're here. So Lisa, let's just start talking about the body. I, you know, I have to say that I've had like a, an interesting relationship with my body, right? Like there's research that says that girls as young as eight years old are on diets, right? And I, as a child, can't really remember a time where my body was right, was correct. You know, I, I always had the feeling that I was there was something wrong with my body from a very young age. I mean, siblings are, they can tease you, but even like family members, everybody I know was, was always had something to say about my weight. And, and it's interesting because I look back at these pictures of me in, in the seventies, I was a little chunky, but I, I was not, you know, like what was the big issue about, you know? Yeah. But And I mean, it's so interesting, Sonia, because we, like I say things, I think every woman um, who's had this experience sometimes will say things um, like I was a little chunky or I was, but it's like, what are we even comparing ourselves to? Right. And that's the first thing, like everyone on this call really just kind of touch in with what you have been taught a good body is for a child, 
Yes. for a female child, a female child, right? And where did we get that from, right? There's already the impression there. And Sonia, I think that more often than not, um, for most of us, our body image has started around the same time. You know, it doesn't start when we're like teenagers and dating or even young adulthood or later in life. It starts usually with childhood. I remember I never really thought about my body. It was just what it was. But I remember I was maybe about four or five. And one of my family friends, a guy picked me up, an adult, and he goes, look at that tummy. It's just like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Look at the way that thing sticks out. And that, you know, like from that point on, I was self-conscious, yeah. conscious about yeah. my body and that somehow or another, just like you said, it wasn't right. It wasn't right. And like what I got into my teenage years, I actually ended up with an eating disorder. I was not, I didn't get anorexic, but I had like, I went on 300 calorie diets. Like three, mm-hmm. I remember my diet was like five M&Ms and a cup of orange juice. Oh. And that's what I ate. And yeah, it came it's not point. funny, but wow. No, yeah. I know, you know, it's so, it's, it's really sad and kind of scary. And then after a while, my grades were affected and my identity was more tied to being smart than being small. So then I switched to trying to do bulimia, but it gave me a headache. So then I was like, uh, but isn't it so like, it does start at a very young age, right? It it does. And, um, you know, back in our day, there wasn't the internet, right? There weren't, there wasn't Reddit, there weren't threads on how to eat like somebody with anorexia. Yeah. Right. Like, um, and I, I like literally that is a thread, but still somehow in most of our schools, peer groups, communities, there was still the, the transference of information. It seemed like among peers, how to diet, how to do all of these little tricks. Like I remember, um, being about 12 years old and swiping x laps from my parents medicine cabinet because I had learned that you could eat all you wanted as long as you had something to get rid to purge the food yeah so you know this is I mean just think of this you're like 9 10 11 12 years old and this is what your relationship with your body is that you will basically abuse your body in some way in order to make it be a certain way that society says is okay. So you can imagine when you become a woman and then you add on sexuality, mm-hmm. you know, you're in this place where you're like, it doesn't look the way it is. I have to look a certain way. It's about sexuality is really about pleasing other people and looking the part to please other people. Right. So, so much gets tied into our body and then We go into, you know, our late 30s, 40s, 50s, things shift around, the the hormones shift around, our body looks Mm -hmm. different than it did previously. But we have this concept like it's like stuck in time that our body should look like a certain age or what we looked like when we were our hottest or some some ridiculous thing like that, right? Um, And we just miss out. We just miss out on what our lives are right now because we're like okay I will I'll you know I'll get into a relationship I'll start dating I will become sexual when I'm a sign yeah right and then five years ten years when you know yes I want to be more intimate with myself or with my partner but I don't look the part my body's you know all I have to do is lose that 20 pounds right and I don't know about you but um there's a, a big gap in time where I was not in any pictures of my children because I didn't look the way I wanted to look. Right. There's such a, I think um, the, the first thing on like Facebook, social media, I saw about this was like, it was almost 12, 15 years ago, but somebody had posted, it was either a meme or a personal post. I don't remember about a woman who you know, was never in pictures with her children and her children as they were getting older, I was like, mom, why? And, you know, solely because of, of the body. And, you know, this all sounds so obvious, but I, I kind of want to slow down and focus in on something that you said about missing out, right? 
And the reason is, and listen, listeners, <laughs> there's no judgment here. Like I have my hand up along with anybody else with whom any of the things that Sony and I have been saying are resonating. But um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the byproduct of the body image issue we have in our culture um, has been with us so long. And when you think about where your brain is focused, like if you thought about if you had to look with your eyes at what was most important to you, um, our culture has our girls and women's eyes on what is wrong with their body. And when our eyes are focused on something all of the time, then the dating, the sex, the enjoyment, the unselfconsciousness, the ability to, or the willingness to be in pictures and to take part in things, right? Those things are, are just kind of like out of our field of vision. Yeah, so when... When do we get to have this life? When do we get to be part of our life, right? That's my question to all of you. Like, if we could get rid of this concept of perfection, our body has to look and be a certain way before we can enjoy life and be part of life. It, this is bullshit. It needs to end. We get to give ourselves permission. Um, like, I remember when I gave myself permission to be in the pictures with my children, because I knew it was important to them. And it also became, a, it was a time where I was spending time learning to love my body, like mm -hmm. learning to be like, okay, this is my body that I have right now. And I want to be in the pictures. I want to be in the life. I want to be in the bedroom. I want to be in the sex, right? So yeah. this is going to require me to come to a place of loving myself, right? Mm -hmm. Loving myself right now, not when I lose the 20 pounds or something like that. Um, and, and so for any of you that are on this call, if you have any questions or anything that you want coaching on, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Please feel free to put it in the chat. We'll definitely get to it. Um, but this is something that is so important to us here to Lisa and I and, and to all of the coaches in the Lit Click team, but um, definitely it's a big issue. We coach on it all the time. Yeah, it is. And, you know, just like loving ourselves or loving our bodies can feel like a really daunting issue to a lot of women. And I think, you know, um, again, I'm always going to point to the external because we were not born hating our bodies. We were not born dissatisfied with our bodies. We were not born comparing our bodies or wanting to change our bodies. It started at some point and it did not start because there was something wrong with our bodies, right? And so even when I talk about that sometimes to women, um, you know, working these questions through, working these issues through, again, there's some perfect version of a body or perfect range of a body that we have been taught to think is right, like fully abled, number one. So it's not right if you are not fully abled, if you have a disability. Um, it's not right if it's a certain height, weight, size, anything, right? Like color, like color, um, you know, the, the pigmentation spots on our skin. There's, there is this tiny, tiny margin of what is right. And so when we talk about, even when I talk about, um, you know, babies weren't born, we weren't born not loving our bodies. Somebody is almost always bound to say, yeah, but their bodies are cute when they're babies, you know? And so I'm always just bringing people back, like find that image that you think is the right body because that image is what's keeping you from loving your own body right and like I said it can feel daunting to want to love it yes but I think so Sonia when you started this work what do you think was your catalyst like what did you need to use or do to start reshaping your relationship with your body I just didn't want to miss out on life anymore you know that's really what it came down to I was tired of and I realized all I need to do was to think a different thought. Like I didn't have to sit there and change my body. There was nothing wrong with my body. What was wrong was my thought that there was something wrong with my body. And if I could get to this place of actually loving my body, I could be kind to it 
and ask and check in with it what it actually needed. Did you need good nutrient, nutritious food? Did you need love? Did you need rest? Did you need a massage? Like, I don't ask it any of that when I'm in this place of hating what it looks like, right? I'm just demanding that it lose weight, demanding that it be a certain way. So when it came to that point where I was like, I don't want to miss out on another day of my life. And I don't want to be miserable, not loving my body anymore. I want to be here and give myself permission. And I think that I saw so much pain in, in so many of my clients that I was coaching as well. And, um, you know, we've all been trained with weight loss as well in the place that we've trained and realizing that you can choose to lose weight if you want to. But please do it from a place of loving your body. Like I, anybody I worked with, I was like, you have to love yourself first. We're not yeah. losing a damn pound. We're going to work on loving yourself first. And then you yeah. choose what you want to do from that place. And I've had women want to hire me to help them love themselves so that in hopes that they would then lose weight. You know, there's this weird fear that, oh, if I just give myself a break, right? Or if I just start doing the work and really listening to all the thoughts in my head about how my body is wrong and, and starting to turn from that and choosing what I want to think about my body, then I'm not going to, you know, I won't want to lose weight or I won't want to do this. And number one, like, would that be a problem though? And number two, body love our loving ourselves enough to respect and honor our body and um kind of like yeah you can keep all that outside noise about the right body that has absolutely nothing to do with our desire to want you know to want good health and even you know some muscle and and good nutrition and you know we can change our body if we want to the problem is right now for a lot of women doesn't feel like a choice yeah She's, it doesn't feel body like it's out on everything yeah but it ultimately is a choice and you know um because of the COVID thing like we couldn't get uh hairdressing appointments right and so something so simple like that but I have been gray since my late 30s and I had dyed my hair since my late 30s up until the time of COVID. There's several mm -hmm. times where I've always, you know, stopped dying, but I always go back to dying it, right? Um, and because of COVID, I was like, I cut it all off. So I started anew. And um, I had to get to this place of really doing the work to love my gray hair. Because I was like, I'm going to start this again, and I'm going to grow it out, and I'm not coloring it anymore because the chemicals were like, I was getting, starting to get reactions to it. I was like, this is not healthy for me. And, you know, all it requires is that I love myself. Right. And I don't think there's a day that doesn't go by that somebody doesn't tell me how beautiful my hair is. Yeah, I love my hair. And I sit there and I think, you know, I started going gray at 32 and by 38, I was almost completely gray. And so, and I'm 56 now. So we're talking almost 20 years that I did not see the beauty that was me mm -hmm. because I was believing somebody else's lie that said you, you couldn't have gray hair. Gray hair meant something about it that was not good, right? You need yeah. to color your hair and all this stuff. And then it makes me think what other lies are out there like that I'm believing, you know, um, but like I did not see my own beauty because it was not the standard, right? Um, and so for everybody on this call, what else are we not seeing? That's our beauty because it's of what the media or advertisers or whatever want you to see something else, right? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to see what the, the people on this call are thinking, like what's coming up for you about this? What aren't we seeing? You know, and here's a question that came up for me when you were talking, Sonia, is did you start thinking I'm going to love my hair despite the fact that it's gray? No, I was just like, I want a relationship with my gray hair. Like I am, yeah. I am a right, the right's gray early, right? Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, even when I posted pictures of me on Facebook with just my gray, I got, I got um, other family members telling me that's not what we do. I even had a family member tell me my grandmother would roll over in her grave if she's <laughs> <laughs> really, so. Wow, your yeah. hair is powerful. 
But this is what, you know, I'm kind of, I was asking almost rhetorically. I'm glad you answered though, because I love that. Sonia Wright has powerful hair. She can make people roll over in their graves. But, you know, this is a lot of times what we do when we think about body love. It's like we set out to love our body, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, despite its imperfections. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's, let's just take the damn in spite of out of it. Mm -hmm. Love our body because it's our body. And if you're vibing with, love your body, or it's something that you would like to be able to do. I'm curious about like, what's coming up for you? Like, why aren't you? Or what feels hard about it? I have some ideas, but I really would love to hear from the people on this call. Yeah. So Uh, go ahead and put in the Q and a, what your thoughts are specifically around this. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit while we're waiting for people to put stuff in the Q and a, um, you know, I coach a lot around body issues and sex and women telling me that they don't want to have sex because they're afraid that their partner is not going to find them attractive. They want to have the lights off when they're having sex. They want to suck in their tummies when they're having sex. Mm -hmm. I hear a, a number of things about there's something wrong with my body and therefore I'm not really going to be in sex because you're, they're not really enjoying sex or in the moment, right? Yeah. Oh, they're up in their head worrying yeah. about, right? That's what yeah. happens to us. Yeah. Try to have an orgasm when you're wondering if you could suck in your belly or not, you know? Yeah, exactly. Or if you have cellulite on the backs of your legs. And so I don't want to put my legs in a certain position, you know? And I mean, just flat out, most partners are so flipping happy that another human being wants to get naked with them. Yes. No yes. lie. No lie. Right. So I think that one thing that we need to um, keep in mind about this is that it's not your partner's thoughts about your body that are keeping you feeling inhibited or having trouble having orgasm or staying with it. It, It's those thoughts are going on in your own head. Right. Come by it naturally because it happens. You know, it's just like we were talking about all of this conditioning we get. But um, I'd love to talk about how to, you know, maybe turn some of those thoughts off. Yeah, actually, we do have a question that's coming in that says, exactly, when I'm in bed with my partner, I can't think about anything except the fact of what my my, my husband is thinking about my body. And mm-hmm. it makes me not want to have sex. So I kind of avoid it because I think that he thinks I'm not attractive. Um, so yeah, and, and you were just talking about this, Lisa, in terms of who exactly is thinking about this? Like, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, number one, we don't know what people are thinking. Number two, if we have a partner that wants to engage in sex with us, they are not thinking about how unattractive you are. Right. They're not thinking things like that. (laughs) That came out wrong. You're not unattractive in the first place. But they're not having thoughts like, oh, she or he is, or they are so unattractive. I know I stuck my foot in my mouth on that one. <laughs> so good. You know, I can't, I can't <laughs> spend that one. time with Sonia without saying something completely. <laughs> anyway, they're, they're not thinking about that, right? Oh, what are the, the odds are they're thinking, they're thinking how beautiful they, you are. They're also probably in a place of anxiety themselves because yeah. they know there's unwritten rules that they can't touch different places on their body on their partner's body like yeah. they can't touch the stomach is like most women are like don't touch my stomach you know how beautiful it is to have your partner touch your your stomach. oh my gosh I used to never want my husband to touch my stomach and one day he's like but it's so soft and I t- took that as an insult but he just meant like the skin on my stomach is just like velvet. And it is just a soft, sweet face. I saw somebody put in the chat, if only I found my body as attractive as my husband does. Yes. Yes. Right. So one of the things is just realizing that if your partner is, um, if you and your partner are engaged in intimacy, probably the last thing they're thinking about is that they find your body unattractive. They might be thinking about their own body, but most of the time when we're, when two bodies get together, 
they're just thinking about, you know, oh, what's next? What's next? Oh, I like this. And for, for you, for the person who's saying, you know, I can't stop thinking about what my husband is thinking about. Um, here's the thing. Those voices are normal. There's nothing wrong with you because you're having those thoughts. Um, and they can be hard to turn down. But this is why I teach embodiment as part of my practice. So what I mean by embodiment is the work of putting our awareness, our consciousness more into our body. Because as women, especially, I think we're always up here. We're always in our head. What's next? What do I have to do next? How did, you know, why was that person rude to me? Did I do that wrong? Are they not, you know, it's all that stuff, right? And we can direct our awareness. We can direct our awareness. So something that I would suggest you play at and just do this playfully. You don't have to get it perfect and it doesn't have to be all the time. But whenever you catch yourself thinking about what you think your husband thinks about your body, bring your awareness back into your body. What am I feeling right now? Like if, if somebody is, if they're touching you, how does that feel? Do I like that? How does the surface we're on feel? You know, all of that, put your attention back into your body. Of course, it's going to go right back up there. That And it's just a continual process. You'll get better and better at it. But so often we don't even feel all the good feels of sex because our brain is working so hard thinking that we're almost unaware of a lot of the little beautiful feelings and nuances that are going on under our chin. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love how you say like, just take a moment, slow down and feel the sensations mm -hmm. without judgment, right? So many women are so focused on either judging their body or judging the fact that they quote unquote, take too long to mm -hmm. like have an orgasm or to get turned on or whatever. And so they're not actually in their body and they have no idea what's going on with their body. And they they're actively working against their body in some ways to like, oh, I, I just want this to end quickly. You know, if I try and get into my body and I focus on pleasure, it might take a little while. And I really want this to be over because I don't want my partner really looking at my body, right? Exactly. Like part of the reason so many women want it to be over fairly quickly, like you said, is just because the experience of it is uncomfortable, not the physical part of having sex. You know, um, it's just like the the suspense and the tension of us going, what are they thinking about my body? Oh, how does that look? Oh, gosh, I've gained weight or I've lost too much weight, you know, whatever it is that's on our mind. So if we start paying attention and getting into the sensations and keep bringing our attention back into our body, would it be so bad if it took a little longer? Because that tension wouldn't be there anymore. We'd be mindful we'd be in it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions about embodiment and mindfulness around self-pleasure? Mm -hmm. You know, same, like bringing your attention into your body. Um, again, sometimes with, even with self-pleasure. So a couple things, my brain is going five different ways and there's a bunch of things I want to say. It depends on how you are um, approaching your self-pleasure. So if you're just like, I want to masturbate because I want to orgasm and release all that tension and then be done, totally different thing than setting yourself up like you were taking yourself and your own body out on the best, you know, night of their life or time of their life, right? So even how you prepare for it ahead of time can be helpful taking into account sensory things like, are you going to do it on your bed? What do you want to be laying on? What do you want things to feel like? Like the more you plan ahead of time for a sensory experience, the easier it's going to be when you're in it to notice things that are going on. And then again, it's like, what if you just let yourself slow down? What if you let yourself explore? What if you teased yourself? a little bit, right? Because, um, you know, have we all had the businesswoman self-orgasm? <laughs> like, like, girl, I got to talk about the businesswoman self-orgasm. Please tell me about this. You must you can know. either confirm, 
nor deny <laughs> the business woman <laughs> self orgasm. So please tell us more about this. <laughs> the business woman self orgasm. It's the I I want to come, but I also have shit to do, and I've got stuff I got to take care of, and so we're gonna get down to business and listen. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also just want to encourage you to set up self-pleasure, set up masturbation for yourself as though you literally were planning to have sex with your own body because that is exactly what you're doing, right? And like I said, the more you plan ahead of time for sensory, like lighting a candle, having some sand, having some great sheets, things like that, you're already priming your brain to go, hmm, should pay attention to what's going on in here, right? And and slowing down and doing some caressing instead of going straight for the straight for the button, if you know, if you get what I mean. Yeah. No, I have no idea what you mean. The people <laughs> at the Lit Clit Club would have not have any idea what you mean. What button are we talking about? <laughs> just discreetly. Yeah. Like just instead of going straight for the clit and and going straight for the orgasm, like a little playfulness and a little time. And then again, so I was in a group once where we were to focus on something. I picked a candle, a little candle that's on my desk. We were supposed to focus on it. And every time our attention strayed and we started thinking we had to put our hand up, all of us were constantly, you know, this is the way it is. And that's why I said, your brain's going to go right back into thinking mode. Just invite it back, bring it back into your body. It's going to go into thinking mode, bring it back into your body. Right. I think that that is so good. I'm going to switch gears a little because I want to talk about the perimenopausal through postmenopausal body, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, we know that there's a shift in our hormones, a decrease in hormones, and that can affect our vulva. We can get vulva atrophy. Uh, it can affect the, the way we interpret stimulation. We may need more stimulation. We Our, our orgasms may shift. Our sensation of pleasure may shift our body feels like it's like it's gone and it's going someplace that we did not authorize it to go. Right. Don't even talk about those damn hot flashes all the time and things like that. But now we're, our orgasms are not the same where our lubrication is not, not there. And, you know, you get a little pissed off. You can be like, what is happening with my body? I always came this way. If I have yeah. nipple stimulation and if I have clit stimulation, I will come. But now it doesn't necessarily work the way it did before. Like, how do you coach somebody that is dealing with those type of things where they kind of feel betrayed by their body? Yeah, and it can. And I think one of the reasons that it can really feel like a bet betrayal of our own, you know, by our own body is because ain't no one talking about this enough. So we true. don't talk about it. Just a few notable books on menopause and perimenopause are not enough. We need to be, con we should be constantly talking about this and spreading the word, right? Because if we're not expecting it, or we think it's not, you know, it's not like widespread, it's just, you know, um, a few people or something like that, then yeah, it's going to catch us off guard and it is going to feel like a betrayal. So usually, um, one of the things that I offer is just some consciousness around the thinking that because your body is no longer working the way it used to, that it is no longer working right, mm -hmm. right? Because that's, that's a couple different things. There's a lot of things, a lot of us women were able to do, I don't know, when we were 17, 18, that we can't now. And, um, you know, maybe I don't spend too much time being mad at myself that I can't, um, you know, jump a hurdle or something anymore. But for some reason, you know, it's like, well, I used to be able to do this, just like you said, right? So it's kind of like, um, your brain has changed over the years. A lot of things have changed over the years. And so has your body. And we are constantly in a relationship with our body that is going to keep shifting from the time we're born to the time we die, right? And so approaching it more like it's time to get to know this body. Yeah. It's time to befriend this body because you're still in this body, your consciousness is, and you want pleasure, got to befriend that body, not accuse it of, you know, bad things. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, we we sit there, we compare things to the past, and we say it needs to be that way. And because it's not that way, what are we not going to do anything? Are we not going to mm-hmm. do any work? It's okay to have to work at this. It's okay yeah. to have to learn a new body. It's okay to have to learn new stimulation. It's it's definitely okay to learn new toys, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And if something's been going on in perimenopause or menopause that has been preventing you from um, having pain-free sex or preventing you from having really enjoyable sex, like how fun to get to know your body better and get the information you need to, of course, you know, to bring back pleasure, to bring back great sex. Yeah. And you can bring it back better than ever, right? Like yeah. it really can be better. It doesn't mean that you don't have to, you know, work at this sometimes, right? right? But it can come back better than it ever was before. It can come back with different amazing sensations. You might focus, maybe before you were just focusing on your vagina, or your vulva, or your, your clitoris. And mm-hmm. now you're focusing a little bit more holistically, your whole body, like, and finding where the sensations are throughout your whole body and tying that in to your pleasure center of your vulva. And I, I'm always going to make a, um, a, like a public service announcement, you know, <laughs> that estrogen is, is it's almost like vitamin E. It's like what we need in our vulva and vaginal area as we're um, postmenopausal. And so you can get something that's localized, go obviously talk to your gynecologist about it, but it will help with, um, with vulva health. And so that's something that we should be having conversations, uh, but it's amazing the number of people that do not have conversations about this because we don't talk about it, right? How many people on this call were like, there's things that your mother never told you about, like uh, about uh, if you happen to be (laughs) postmenopausal, like there's things that your aunts, your mothers, like somebody that was older and wiser than you did not mention, right? (laughs) We're all like, well, Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, it, not just that, but like there, there are a lot of people who um, did not get like a the full picture from their doctors, unfortunately. A hundred percent, because honestly, like the doctor's not trained about the full picture. We're not mm-hmm. trained in this at all. So this is where it becomes important for us to advocate. But if we're thinking that there's something wrong with our body, uh, and we're in this place where we're like, well, this is just the way it's going to be then we don't advocate for ourselves and we lose our sexuality over a period of time. And this is why we're bringing it up in all different aspects of things. And, and definitely with body image, if we have a feeling that there's a right way for the body to be and a wrong way for the body to be, as soon as we start labeling things wrong, then we come to a place of shame around it. As soon as we come to a place of shame, then we stop like trying to investigate and see what we can do to help the situation. And so that's why it's important to like, just don't label it as something that's gone wrong, you know? Right. Exactly. It's like, if we respond to it as a problem, like to me, um, one of the things I teach, I'm sure you do too, is things aren't a problem unless we decide they're a problem, right? So if we're always responding to our body as doesn't work the same way, now I have to use more lube and now I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Like that isn't freeing you to experience the pleasure that is available to you and the pleasure that you can create. Whereas it's just like, this is, I'm in a new phase of relationship through my body and how fun is this going to be? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I love how, I love how you're saying like a new phase of relationship with my body. And this is very true. Like the body I had in my forties is not the body I have in my fifties. It's not going to be the body I have in my sixties. It's not going to be the body I have in my seventies, eighties, or nineties, or even when I make it to a hundred, right? Like it's going to go through changes and I get to love the body I have in each one of those stages and, and just to marvel at it. Uh, looks like we have, I'm teaching my mom about menopause. Ah, I love it. Uh, ah. She happily believes she never really had menopausal symptoms or changes. Okay. Well, hey. <laughs> I know. Great. You know, I asked my stepmom too about menopause and she's like, no, never really. I'm like, you never had one hot flash. Nope. Um, and she said, I just, I felt like I was flying. And I'm like, 
where do you sign up for that? That's what's great. <laughs> and I often wonder about like, has like our food changed like uh, over the years and that may be impacting menopause as well. Mm-hmm. You know, is that, what is it about our lifestyle that may be impacting menopause versus, you know, was it the same? Or like if we were all, I mean, your family comes from a farming background, but if we were all like really towing the land and really working in and out exercising all day long, I wonder if we would experience things the same way. I know? mean, it's interesting when you think of biology and evolution. Um, also, though, I think, okay, we don't need to get too political, but I think that there, our, our nation is one of more industrialized ag now, and there are um, a lot of studies done about the nutrients in a lot of foods are not the same as they were back in the 70s, 60s etc. Um, yeah, somebody else is saying no one spoke to me about intimacy or anything else. Yeah, I didn't really either. I mean, nobody, um, nobody told me that. And I remember when I went into my OB, because I suspected I had entered actual menopause. Um, you know, she shared a little, but it was more just kind of like jokey and welcome to the menopause club girl. And you know, I I didn't get a whole lot and I think so highly of her, but I have learned more working with Dr. Sonia over the past couple of years and going, damn, well, I wasted a lot of time. (laughs) I I still, that's still so much I'm learning. I was on a a sexual health call with Evelyn Resch. And if anybody has not been on a call with Evelyn, you need to come to those calls. She was still edgy. I I was still learning. I was like, what? You know? So it it continues. We all had something to learn about this thing. So that's the important thing about uh, the work that we do is that we get to decide what is our relationship with our body? How do we want that relationship to be? And how do we want it to be in perspective of our sexuality, our intimacy in our lives? Now, you know, as your body changes and your sexuality might change too, the way the sexual intimacy looks like. Right. So you get to choose if you want to continue penetration or not. If you choose to continue penetration um, and it happens to be painful, check in with your gynecologist because you will probably need localized estrogen and maybe even testosterone. And um, you may even need some um, pelvic floor physical therapy type of thing. And definitely if you need if your lubricant is like if you need lubricant, then that's something that you'll need to add on as well, right? But if you choose not to like uh, have penetration, that is an option as well. Like you get to choose how you want your sexual intimacy to go. Uh, And as time changes, you know, there may be other factors that impact things. And then um, like, I have so many thoughts in my head, right? I have thoughts about your your partner is also on this lifelong where their body is changing too, right? So if you happen to have a partner that has a penis and they are dealing with erectile dysfunction, that's gonna impact your sexuality as well, what your sexual intimacy looks like, right? If you have a partner and their libido is shifting and they're not as interested in sex, that's gonna impact things as well. There's like so many different ways. So yes, we have uh, our relationship with body image and our body, and then our body is changing over time. If we engage with other people, their um, their body is changing as well. And so it's like two or more bodies coming together <laughs> that are changing <laughs> over time, and that's impacting sexual intimacy as well. And then if you're solo partnered, if you're a single woman, yeah, your sexual intimacy may also be impacted. And we kind of alluded to this a little bit, but when your androgens, your estrogens are decreasing in your system, uh, and this is not just all about menopause, but it, it, this is a lot of the times when people have a big shift in what their body is doing is around that time. And they, um, your sensations change, right? And your orgasms may not be as strong or the sensations in your vulva may not be as strong. Um, then we do get to look at different ways to improve that as well. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, Sonia, so good. You know what I was, one thing too, I was thinking about um, while you were talking is all of these changes that do come upon us in perimenopause, you know, and menopause. Um, I know so many women who hit their late 40s, 50s, mid 50s, and they're just done with all so much BS. 
And they're like, I have put up, like, I have a friend once that told me when she turned 50, she's like, I have kissed ass my whole life and now everyone can kiss mine. <laughs> and the reason, the reason I'm bringing that up is because this is an age in our life where we are like really being asked to step into our freedom and our fierceness and our self allyship in ways very different or at least somewhat different from how we've done it in the past and even more so right like if you even just look at the 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 age cycle of you know um metaphorical like mythological women like the maiden mother crone right we're entering into a crone stage and crones they're out for they're looking after themselves they're looking after their needs. They don't need other people's cooperation by being sweet to help them anymore. So I know I'm getting a little off topic here, but I do want you to see like how all of these body changes and all of these um, different factors in our intimacy that can come up around menopause are also an opportunity for we women to really take a stand for ourselves in a whole new way. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the stand starts with ourselves, like taking a stand against what we're thinking about ourselves mm -hmm. and, and the questioning, are these thoughts serving me? Are these thoughts helpful? Uh, what exactly have I been taught? And do I want to keep these thoughts about my body and what it needs to look like? And um, sometimes I'll like lead people through an exercise where we focus on the parts of our body we really like. Mm -hmm. And what we say about those parts of our bodies, you know, like, oh, our, our scapulas are so beautiful, our clavicles or like our, our breasts or the cleavage or smile or something like that. And all the beautiful words that we use to describe the part of our body we love. Oh, my smile is brilliant. It's just, it, you know, radiates or whatever. And then take those same exact descriptions and put it on a part of our body we don't necessarily. Mm, yeah, like overlaying them almost like a... I, I see a bathroom mirror that you're writing stuff. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Yeah, like you just shift that bathroom mirror from like a feature that you like down to a feature that you don't necessarily like. And then be like, oh, beautiful, strong, brilliant, marvelous, you know, and you're just like, there's no difference here. It is a body part, right? Yeah, it's totally true. And, you know, one thing that I, I often do with um, clients when we talk about body image. And I'll just, you know, if you're on the call, put your hand anywhere on your body, like anywhere. Right. And now put your hand on your body image. Because <laughs> where is it? Right. They are not the same thing. And it is our body image that is getting in the way of everything. Um, so a couple of things. You don't have to 100% approve of every single thing about your body to love your body and to even say that part of me is beautiful, right? You don't like, I think some people are just like, oh, until I can just see it and it takes a while, right? But I want you to think about the reason we have body image issues is because of long, slow conditioning that we haven't even seen as conditioning. We've just seen it's like, oh, that's the way it is this kind of body is right, right? So I want you to think about how big of an impact you could have on yourself if you just did the conditioning on yourself in a different way, right? You learned, we all learned in some way probably that our body isn't quite right. We can also teach ourselves and learn that our body is spot on, that our body is the perfect thing for us, that our body is beautiful and capable of so much and so much pleasure and deserves so much. I love that. Our body deserves pleasure. Our body is capable of so much. Our body is beautiful and strong. And yeah, you know, when you just start thinking of your body in a different way. Yeah, so true. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, I think the older I get, I get more and more grateful for my body because, you know, I we're getting to the age where, our parents are starting to die, our aunts and uncles, maybe even some of our peers and life just gets more and more fragile. 
And um, I'm always like, oh, thank you, body. Every morning I wake up. <laughs> I know, it's so true. Like um, I had knee surgery. I've had knee problems since I was about 10 years old. And I had my first knee surgery when I was 19 and my second one when I was 21. And I was always like, you know, I have these knees, they suck, blah, blah, blah. But at 56, my knees are actually doing better than a lot of people's now. So <laughs> it's interesting <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to be at that place where you're like, oh, wait, you know, my knee it still works. I can still walk on it, right? <laughs> no, yeah. And it's like, it's hard to be grateful when it's hard until... I, I've just watched, um, I've watched so many people who eventually their mobility might decline. And then they were like, if only I hadn't taken for granted, you know, so there's that. And there's also just kind of swinging back around to the sex thing. Like what would be different for you? Anyone listening to this call, what would be different for you in your intimate life? If you gave yourself I really want you to hear this because society will never give any of us permission to think other than, you know, the way it wants us to. So we can just set that to the side. That's across the board on everybody about everything, right? But if you gave yourself permission to think differently about your body and love it and honor it and see it as beautiful and see it as like the vessel and the giver of pleasure for you what would be different that's so good yeah yeah I think people's relationship with their body would definitely shift from one of impatience to one of like kindness and love and understanding and appreciation I think definitely I know from a lot of coaching that I've done um that it would shift in terms of if you happen to be partnered in terms of being more open to intimacy. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't necessarily lead to like taking your clothes off and having to face your concepts of, you know, yourself and your body, you know, um, there'd be more acceptance and allowance and, and attention and, um, and lack of avoidance. Yes, for sure. Somebody saying I would strut my stuff with vivaciousness. Ooh, that's right. word. Yes. And just to let you know, um, you have full permission to do that now. And wouldn't it be fun just to try that on? Yeah. Try it on for an hour in the grocery store <laughs> or an hour in the bedroom or an hour, hour wherever you are, five minutes where you are. <laughs> I, I think everybody should have a pair of come fuck me shoes, like, <laughs> the ones that you can't wear anywhere, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but like you put on for two seconds and then like, whenever we feel sexy, we think it's because we put on an outfit or something like that, but it's really about how we're now thinking about ourselves. Yeah. Right? And so sometimes, I mean, it's fun to put on the sexy negligee and things like that, but it's almost like maybe we'll give that as a homework assignment to everybody. Like to go put on the negligee and then take your journal out and start writing down your thoughts that you're thinking in that negligee, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> oh, I would fall and break my hip. <laughs> so many things. Well, then. Um... <laughs> a lot of screaming in the bedroom, but not necessarily in the tight that we're hoping for. <laughs> Listen, I, I fell off my own platform sandals one year. <laughs> oh. <laughs> fell off of my own sandals. Yeah, but um, I know it, I, I get it. And we don't want you to break your hip, but like have it's something nice. to hang on to nearby. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> A hundred percent to hang on to, but, but it's like the free flowing of thoughts about ourselves as we acknowledge that we're sexual beings in the body that we have, you know, in order to be sexual beings, all we need is a body and mind and permission. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, like we have every, all the prerequisites that are necessary. We have them all. But then we just kind of have to shift our thoughts around as to what is acceptable. And I think sometimes I, I was just, I was like, oh, okay. 
Um, the reason I had asked you much earlier in the call, like, what did it take for you to start loving your body? And you, you went off on this beautiful, um, explanation of how you were saying, I just got tired of not enjoying it. Or, um, I can't remember exactly what you said, Sonia, but I was, I was asking it because, um, you know what? It takes courage to love your body in a world that has taught most people that their bodies are not worth loving unless they look like, you know, whatever it is, right? And courage is available to all of us too. Courage doesn't feel good. Courage basically feels like fear or concern, but it's just the 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 feeling of I'm going to dare to do it anyway. And um, you know, if 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 I could give everybody, if I could give the whole world something, I would like get out my little magic wand with a star on the end and give everybody a little tap on the top of their head with the courage stick, right? Because um, just to activate your own courage on behalf of yourself and behalf of your body. Yes. Yes. So good. So good. I just put in the chat and I'll also have it in the show notes. I'll put in the chat here that um, we have a couple more days left in this month uh, for the Lit Click Club. And we would love you to join us. Uh, so I put it in, in the chat and we'll put it in the show notes as well. Just click on that link and come join us. Come join us in all the fun that we're having. It's definitely an amazing place. <laughs> and we have to, the thing is, it's a safe environment for us to have these conversations, for us to exchange this information, to be able to talk about things that people are not necessarily talking about. And that's the reason why we created this place. We created it for you. So we want to thank you for everybody that's on this call. If there's um, any last questions that you have or comments, please go ahead and put it in the chat or in the Q&A. And we're here definitely to answer any question that you have. Um, it's just been a pleasure to have you all on this call. And Coach Lisa, it's just, it's just a joy as always. Um, oh, it's yes. been great. I'm seeing visions of Lit Lit Club swag. Ooh, yes. <laughs> How can there not be, right? How <laughs> oh, can there not be? And I am going to have a hella body image. <laughs> I'm going to strut that stuff with vivaciousness. <laughs> I love that. Like, <laughs> I'm thinking of a, a Tina... There was Tina, there's a singer back in the 80s called Tina Somebody, and she had a song called Strut. And so <laughs> we're going to like, it's Tina, not Tina Maria, it was somebody, Sheena, it was Sheena Easton, actually. Oh, okay. A song called Strut. And we're going to strut, strut our asses off <laughs> and I just really um, like find the love for our bodies. Find the love for our bodies because we have everything that we need right here, right now. All we need to do is unload the crap, the thoughts around our body and upload the thoughts about how beautiful our body is and how we get to accept it. It doesn't have to be quote unquote perfect. We don't have to change it. We just get to change our mind and we can also change our lives. That's so beautiful. And I think everybody on this call, if you have two minutes after the call, grab a piece of paper or your phone and um, write down three new thoughts yes. that you love to think about your body, that you love to start practicing, thinking yes. about your body. 100%. Give yourself permission to practice those thoughts. Okay, everybody. So good of you to join us. We love you very much. And thank you for everything. We will talk to you soon. Dr. Sonia and Coach Lisa, we are out. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.